So I'm going to give an introduction to the uh, Structural Vibration Acoustics Group, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Micah Shepard uh, to give the bulk of the talk. So we got a lot of group members, and here they are. It's probably one of our biggest group. The title <laughs> seems pretty obvious that it is. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, just kind of go through some of the uh, student uh, work. Uh, I'm pleased that we have four contestants in this year's poster competition, so good luck to them. It'd be nice for somebody in the group to win one. Uh, we've got uh, John Broyles uh, looking at uh, concrete floor, vibroacoustic transmission. And then uh, Sean Collier, this is kind of a machine learning thing, regime sorting, and uh, looking at uh, multi-scale vibrations. And then we've got uh, some Navy shock analysis. Jason Samut, advised by uh, Matt Lear. And then uh, John Young is looking at uh, power flow uncertainty. Uh, this is uh, looking, well, I'll let John tell, tell you about it. <laughs> But uh, all of them very diverse, interesting uh, topics. I'm looking forward to seeing the posters. Uh, here's some research that's going on that it is not part of the poster competition, but uh, also of interest. Uh, James looking at carbon nanotube speakers. If you haven't heard of those, those are kind of cool. Uh, it's a very different way of making sound. Uh, it's just getting a kind of a sheet with a lot of embedded nanotubes in it, and you can pass voltage through it and uh, get some pretty high sound levels out of it, uh, other than they very different than your traditional piston-like speaker. So that's kind of neat. Uh, black holes, uh, I'm sure Micah will be uh, talking a bit about this in uh, his talk, but Cam McCormick's been looking at that for a while, as has Emily Stinson. Actually, she just started, but um, a lot of black hole work, work going on here at uh, Penn State. And then uh, Yu Shang, I think he might be done, but um, okay, yeah, I think he just graduated. He's been at this a while. And then um, I should have moved you to the graduated list, but I didn't, but here's a list of our graduates, so uh, congratulations to them. Uh, Katie Crank. Looking at uh, Hurley's, if you know what that is, it's like some sort of uh, Australian sporting bat, <laughs> I think it is. But Dan Russell uh, works with uh, sports equipment all the time, so that was kind of a fun one. Uh, Connor just finished up uh, looking at extreme value statistics of flow-induced vibration. Uh, gone off to work for um, uh, Wave 6. Uh, Gary Rhodes, who Micah advised, uh, was looking at uh, measuring plate vibration with deflectometry. You're going to see a presentation uh, from Olivier Robin of uh, University of Sherbrooke in a little bit here on exactly the topic. It's pretty cool, just kind of aiming a camera at a mirror and uh, pulling out the entire vibration field of, uh, of a vibrating structure. And then uh, some more on uh, concrete uh, floors and buildings. Uh, well, that's John. Uh, I talked about him already, but uh, he did graduate. And uh, that's it for my intro. So if you don't have any questions for me, I can turn it over to uh, Dr. Shepard who's been working on acoustic black holes and a lot of other topics here at uh, Penn State, including design optimization uh, for, uh, for many years. So this is a chance to give you some highlights of uh, the work he and his students have been up to. There's your clicker. I'm just trying to stay close to the mic. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'll try to make sure I talk close to the microphone. Um, make sure the mask doesn't uh, muffle anything too bad. Uh, so uh, today I will give a, a brief update of some recent applications of the acoustic black hole effect. Um, what we see here, let's see if the laser uh, is somewhat visible. Uh, we have here um, an animation that uh, shows a wave coming down a beam and going into this uh, power law taper and uh, propagating through the taper all the way through the end. And, th and this taper here is uh, what is commonly referred to today as uh, the, uh, an acoustic black hole. The acoustic black hole effect is when there's a power law taper in a structure and as the um, thickness of the structure here, a beam, decreases and in theory, it goes down to, uh, in the limit to zero. Uh, the wave speed traveling down this uh, part of, of the uh, taper will continue to uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller as the wave approaches zero. And uh, in the limit that it goes to zero, the wave speed will also go to zero, and you'll have a wave which uh, basically uh, enters into this taper and, and never returns. Um, in practice, uh, that can never happen, but the, the acoustic black hole effect has been shown to have many interesting applications, uh, particularly in the area of, of acoustics and vibration. 
And um, so I'll show a couple of different uh, applications that have been worked on recently uh, here at Penn State. Um, real quick, uh, one of the things that's interesting here that uh, I forgot to mention is that as the wave travels down the beam, you see some amplification happening here in the, in the taper. And uh, that is one of the important effect, um, effects from the acoustic black hole effect is that you have this uh, energy focusing here, uh, which then allows you to more effectively damp out the uh, vibrations by um, placing some kind of uh, rubber or dissipative material in the taper. Uh, here's a, a highlight of some work that's been uh, done here over the last couple of years. Um, so uh, we've been fairly active, uh, several different uh, faculty researchers. Uh, we did a short course here, I believe, two years ago. Um, and uh, so these are some, some different things that have uh, been published in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, Dr. Conlon and Dr. Smith with a, um, their student, uh, Yu Xiang, uh, a former student, uh, Phil Furtado, um, uh, worked with myself and Dr. Conlon. Uh, here's some Dr. Conlon and Dr. Uh, now Dr. Furtado. And recently defended uh, Dr. Cameron McCormick. Here's some work that uh, we published uh, back in 2019. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, this, there was a, um, a study published in the Journal of Sound and Vibration uh, that overviewed the recent work of uh, studying acoustic black hole um, the acoustic black hole effect in different applications. Um, you can see the original paper, um, which was published by uh, Mironov in 1988. And uh, basically, there was a gap where nothing was done. And uh, Viktor Krylov then began doing more work in this area. And in the um, late 2010s, uh, it started to pick up. And in the last decade, there's been uh, quite a bit of work that's been published in this area. Uh, the dark blue, or dark black, um, dark gray is uh, journal articles, and the, the lighter gray is conference proceedings. And uh, what I wanted to point out here is uh, over 10% of these papers that have, that have been published, um, and, and they've all been in the last decade, have been with Penn State authors. And uh, since this, um, this uh, little graph was created, there have been two more journal, journal articles published by Penn State authors, and at least one has been submitted. It's possible more that I'm just not aware of. Uh, so we're continuing to stay kind of on the forefront of this research um, as it moves forward, and it's moved forward uh, very rapidly. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some recent, recent developments. Um, this, uh, a lot of this work uh, that I'll talk about was performed by uh, now Dr. Cameron McCormick. Um, and this is looking at uh, different ways to kind of intelligently do a design of, a, of an acoustic black hole to uh, get an optimal performance uh, so that your uh, design metric, which might be uh, lower vibration or lower radiated noise or something like that, is kind of approached in, in a formal optimization way so that you can uh, say that you have the optimal design and it performs in the best way. Uh, previous work has kind of uh, was, uh, usually was considering how a wave would come into uh, this taper and how much of it would be reflected back uh, from, from this taper. Uh, so some of the early, er, earlier work kind of was looking at those type of metrics. As we've moved on into different types of applications, we're now more interested in what's the overall vibration reduction that's created by the, this ABH. Uh, so this uh, study was done where we want to consider, is, is the best uh, design when you're considering a reflection coefficient, is that going to be the best design for when you're considering vibration reduction? And so we have a beam here, which has a, a, a clamp boundary condition. And then you have, uh, it's terminated with a, an ABH, which has some amount of damping on it. And then we're gonna, we're gonna vary some of the parameters of this until we find uh, uh, the optimal design of the ABH that terminates this beam. Uh, to do that, first we have to have a, a method which can efficiently compute what the vibration is of the beam. Um, and the method that was used here is the transfer matrix method, which I'll go over just very briefly. Uh, if we start out with some segment of, of a beam, uh, we have here just one side, which we'll call x equals 0, and the other side of the beam, x equals L. And then all of these state variables, which are displacement, moment, uh, excuse me, uh, rotation, moment, and shear, 
uh, on both ends of this beam. And we can, sim we can uh, relate the uh, displacement from one side to the other using a matrix, which we'll just call Z here, and uh, won't get into the math of how to, how to do that. But that's using the basic uh, equations of motion for a beam. Um, if you have a longer section of beam, you simply just have more sections that you break up your, your beam in. So you can see each one of these has uh, a transformation from one side of the segment to the other side, and you have this Z matrix, which gives you that transformation. And we can just take the deflection on one side and just transform it to the other side and continue to do that as we move along the beam until we get to the other side. And then you have the entire uh, vibration uh, at, at these uh, numbers of, of segments of the beam. So you, the, the more segments that you break it up into, the more uh, accurate representation of the entire beam vibration you have. And you can simply uh, multiply together all of these transformation matrices, Z, and uh, go from one end of the beam all the way over to the other side. The nice thing about this method is now we have control over what the actual parameters of each little segment are. Um, if the, the beam that we're interested in is not actually uh, constant from one side to the other, but has small variations in thickness, we can now just modify the transformation matrix and we have uh, what would be a, a very complicated uh, untractable solution we can now solve. So we take a, a varying cross-sectional beam and we just break it up into its little segments and uh, we can do the solution. Um, it turns out that uh, you can run into st some stability issues with that numerical technique. And uh, so we were able to use a, a, a Riccati, a stabilized Riccati transform uh, transfer matrix method to uh, get rid of some of the stability issues. And we're able to uh, solve for the vibration and then hooked up the, this uh, TMM approach with uh, a formal mathematical optimization and find what the optimal parameters were for reducing noise, or reducing vibration. Uh, so a little kind of block diagram illustrating that. So we have an optimizer here, uh, which I'm not gonna get into, but if you're interested in knowing more about that, please come talk to me. And uh, the optimizer chooses what design variables to evaluate. Uh, and the design variables are the length of the acoustic black hole, the uh, minimum thickness, and then the taper. So the taper can vary between two and all the way up to 10 or 12. Um, and uh, of course, the length of the ABH has to be less than the length of the entire beam. And uh, this just has to be non-zero. We put a practical limit on there for a lower bound. And then uh, once the optimizer sends these uh, design parameters to the uh, algorithm, the vibration is, is computed using these design parameters. And uh, an objective function is computed, which is here is called j, and j is a function of all of these design parameters. And this is basically an integrated value of the, um, uh, basically the kinetic energy, integrated uh, across the length of the beam, from zero to Lx, and also over, over some frequency range, uh, omega a to omega b. And once we do that, we ran through all, all the iterations needed for the optimizer to converge on an optimal solution, and we end up with our um, optimal uh, ABH design. Now, if we use uh, what was kind of previously established as the best way to design an ABH when we're just considering the reflection coefficient, uh, we would come up with um, uh, the longest length that you could do, which using the current method, we got the same answer. We want the longest beam that you can, you can put in there. Um, we have the same um, th minimum thickness of the uh, AVH. And then we see something that's quite a bit different. Uh, previous work would have put the uh, taper power at the highest possible value that you could do. And that, according to the theory for reflection coefficient, would give you the best design. What we found here is that we actually wanted a reflection or the taper power that was uh, m equals three. And that gave us uh, almost a factor of two lower objective function. We see here 0.299 versus 0.35. Here are the spectra of uh, what those designs look like. The uh, dotted line would be the unmodified beam. 
Um, and that was given as a reference here as one. Um, and then we have the uh, current optimum design in black, solid, versus the previous one, which would be here. And what we see is, is something that's interesting. Um, First of all, you see that there's a drop in amplitude from the unmodified beam, but you also see that there's a number of more modes that have uh, kind of come into this spectral uh, range. And that's an artifact that you're always going to have to deal with when you um, uh, are working with the acoustic black holes. But what you see is, for the previous effort, you see that there are more modes that have kind of been scrunched down into this region, and therefore the overall total integrated level is actually higher when you have uh, a higher taper power than when, when you have a lower taper power. So that was an in interesting um, conclusion that we made, that when you're designing uh, a, an embedded ABH in a system, you really need to consider the, uh, the end goal of, of your um, analysis, which for us was vibration reduction, and not look at some of the theory which is based solely on reflection coefficient. Uh, as we kind of studied these results, it became apparent that that even though we have an answer here, there wasn't a really easy way to generalize uh, an ABH so that the performance kind of could be compared from multiple scales. Um, if we had a kind of a larger ABH versus a smaller one with a longer versus shorter length, uh, different changes in the minimum thickness, those couldn't really be compared very well um, in an apples to apples way. So it became um, important to uh, generalize the performance and kind of make them in a, in a uh, not be able to compare them in a non-dimensional way. Uh, so here's, here's two examples of, of why that might be. You have uh, a simple plate with a, a circular APH in it. Dimensions are A, A1 by A1, so it's just a square plate, and you have a radius of R. Um, the thickness of this plate is what's we'll called H1, and the minimum thickness is H0. And you can see uh, uh, a somewhat poor representation of what that uh, curvature would look like from a side view. If we then compare that, we want to know how the performance of this compares to the performance of this other plate, which has different dimensions. Here, it's a rectangle, so it's A2 by B2. We have a smaller AVH, a smaller thickness, and a... And, um, a, uh, a, a lower uh, minimum thickness, okay? So all of the parameters are different. How do we compare those? Um, we also might have a different frequency range that we're interested in, um, as well as all of these uh, geometrical differences. We also can have differences in the base material. For example, we might have uh, aluminum versus steel, or uh, maybe a composite material versus a foam. And you can, of course, have differences in the damping configuration. So here we have a much smaller uh, piece of damping material with a, a, a kind of a larger thickness versus here a much thinner uh, piece of damping material that's much larger. Um, so the goal is how do we compare these in, in a uh, kind of non-dimensional way that is uh, independent of scale? Uh, so there's uh, a number of non-dimensional parameters uh, first is uh, somewhat common in the field of acoustics, relative frequency. That's where we're taking the, the wave number and multiplying by some scale that's uh, um, used in your analysis. So in this case, A would be the length of the base structure. And then we have another uh, parameter where we have the relative scale of the ABH compared to the base length of the structure. So here we have uh, R, which is the radius, and A, which is the length, and a factor of two because this is radius, not diameter. Uh, we can also compare the ratio of the wave speeds. So if we have a really thick plate that's going down to a really small thickness, we want to be able to compare the relative effect of, of that kind of change in wave speed. And uh, all of the parameters cancel out except for the uh, thicknesses uh, of the base and the minimum ABH thickness, uh, which we're calling H1 and H0. Um, of course, the taper power is uh, an important, so that's the rate of change of the thickness, uh, and that is uh, somewhat non-dimensional already. And the final non-dimensional parameter relates to the gradient at the center of the AVH. And so that's this factor gamma 
which is divided by H naught. And the gamma is related to how you define uh, this, um, this taper. So uh, we're, now, we're now able to uniquely define four parameters that are independent of scale. Um, you'll notice that one thing that wasn't considered here is the damping configuration. Uh, so we're just going to assume that uh, the damping configuration is equal between the two, uh, between uh, the structures that we're comparing. And we'll leave that for uh, a future investigation to try and work, work through that. Uh, we're also just concerned with uh, square panels, uh, so, and also uh, homogeneous materials. Uh, again, we'll leave that for future work to figure out a way to non-dimensionalize those parameters out. Um, so to have a universal uh, assessment of the uh, performance of the AVH for vibration reduction, uh, we define the power dissipated, co uh, power dissipated ratio, which is the vol uh, where you integrate the power dissipated over the volume of the damping material and then divide by the input power. Uh, and I apologize, these are uh, switched. Power input is, is right here. Power dissipated is right here. Um, and you can uh, compute those in, uh, for example, a finite element program, um, or if you're able to uh, get access to some of the damping matrices or the strain uh, within the material. And here, uh, the power in is going to be related to the imaginary part of the displacement. This was all implemented in uh, a finite element library, uh, which is known as DL2. And, um, it was further linked up with an optimizer, um, but uh, won't have time to get into that today. So this, uh, this power dissipated ratio here is a way to directly measure the AVH's ability to concentrate energy uh, into the AVH and then to focus it into the dissipated material. Uh, here's an, exa an example of what a non-dimensional performance plot might look like. So here we have power. Uh, the power ratio is a function of Ka, which is a non-dimensional frequency. And you have the, uh, a uniform panel shown in the dotted orange. And you see some areas where the damping material is able to be exercised fairly well, and you get some, uh, some good uh, dissipation in the structure at these two kind of frequency bands. What's, uh, what we see with a, an acoustic black hole is that, first of all, the, uh, you cut on earlier a slightly lower Ka, and that the, uh, the power dissipated ratio is higher over a larger band. So once you kind of cut on at this Ka around four, uh, it stays fairly high for most of that uh, non-dimensional frequency with only a small dip here shown around uh, Ka equals uh, six and a half versus a much larger drop um, that you see in the base structure around seven and around 10. So, we uh, have now uh, a way to compare uh, the performance of an acoustic black hole in terms of its vibration reduction ability in a non-dimensional way so we can compare uh, different um, structures in kind of an apples to apples way. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right, uh, there are a couple of new projects which are, are coming online. Um, they are close to being able to share something, but not quite there. So uh, this will be a little bit of a teaser. Um, uh, the first one is uh, looking at acoustic black holes and their ability to have a reduced radiation efficiency. So you can have a panel which will radiate into sound uh, less effectively because the, uh, the taper gives you a lower thickness and then the wave speed is gonna end up being uh, lower than the speed of sound and air and therefore uh, will uh, not couple as well into the medium and won't radiate as efficiently. Um, and we're doing some numerical and some uh, experimental studies here. And the uh, second project is looking at uh, incorporating an acoustic black hole into um, a rotorcraft panel and trying to uh, put both active and damping, active and passive damping material into the panel to help get a, um, a more effective range of uh, dissipation into the AVH using the active and damping, active and passive damping approach. Um, in the remaining time, uh, I'll give a very brief overview of some other work which has recently been published, uh, which was done by uh, Yu Xiang, Dr. Steve Conlin, and Dr. Ed Smith. Um, so this is not work that, that I worked on, 
but uh, I think it's very interesting, uh, kind of the areas that are moving, we're moving into here. Um, what was done here in this study is a, a transmission loss of not just a single AVH uh, dimension uh, embedded in a panel, but what we're calling a multi-scale AVH panel. So here we see uh, a four by four uh, uniform, or sorry, a four by five set of uniform AVH uh, cells embedded into this plate. And then there was uh, transmission loss measurements which were performed in uh, our uh, facility in Hammond building. Then uh, have a multi-scale panel where we have two scales of AVHs and um, I guess that's a six by six set of AVHs. The uh, aluminum looking uh, material that's kind of shiny, that's actually a, a damping material which is placed inside the, the cell. And um, the uh, effect that was measured here was also simulated. Um, I believe that was using the COMSOL program. Uh, and what, what the result was, that's pretty interesting. Um, first of all, all of the uh, simulations were validated using uh, flat plates. And then uh, when they modeled the, um, the multi-grid and the single-grid AVH panels, you saw um, when there's no damping material, you see these big drops in the transmission loss of the multi-grid panels, um, which is this dotted red line. But once you added damping material, into those AVHs, the amount of transmission loss jumped way up and is this red line with the uh, 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 diamonds. The single uh, scale AVH is the blue line with the squares. So it was able to outperform the single scale AVH panel uh, by a couple of dB once you hit uh, about two or three kilohertz. Um, the below that frequency, you basically lined up exactly with the uh, undamped panel. So you weren't actually able to exercise the, uh, any improvement using the AVHs. But above that frequency, you saw a very good performance. The, uh, the undamped uniform plate, of course, has its dip due to the coincidence, uh, which was largely um, basically removed entirely for both the single scale and multi-scale multi AVHs. And you see uh, quite, a, quite a good performance in the transmission loss of that panel. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I have today. Um, again, this is just a highlight of some work that was done, also uh, done previously. Uh, I believe uh, um, Yu Xiong has uh, graduated. And I will say um, Cameron McCormick, uh, he defended in August. A lot of this work was from him. He is uh, currently on the job market. If uh, anybody is interested in uh, pursuing uh, more AVH work or some sort of uh, computational acoustics or vibroacoustics, I'm sure he'd be interested in talking. Uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Hello, this is Tom Flynn, Babcock and Wilcox. Um, I, I don't know anything about this topic, so uh, this was really interesting to me. Uh, my question is, can you give me some practical applications of how this would be integrated into component design? And if you're thinning the material, do you incur structural strength decreases where you're thinning the material? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Very good question. I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, yes, you, you would uh, have some kind of decrease in strength of the, of the panel or beam. Uh, and there are um, different uh, ways that have been, are being considered to kind of uh, compensate for that. Um, so of course, uh, the more natural application would be on a some sort of panel that would not have uh, a major impact on the load bearing. Um, for example, uh, what you can see here, um, if you have some kind of panel, oops, 
some kind of panel where you're just trying to prevent transmission through the panel, um, you can, uh, you know, if you're able to, you know, within the practical limits of your application, uh, put these embedded ABHs in there, you will be able to get some uh, pretty good improvement in the transmission loss characteristics, uh, you know, in these higher frequency areas by including that into your panel. Uh, some other applications uh, are, are being actively looked at. Um, I believe there have been some uh, implemented in uh, turbine blades. I believe in, uh, some researchers in England have, uh, have done that. Um, and, and we're also currently looking at different applications which will consider all aspects of the design, uh, including the strength. <laughs> Thank you.